Hello and welcome to Particle Measuring Systems webinar titled ISO 17141 and ISO 14698 Overview. This 40-minute discussion will provide insight to the new standard for microbiological monitoring and control and how it harmonizes with ISO 14698 parts 1 and 2. The presentation will begin shortly, but there are a few housekeeping items I would like to discuss first. My name is Blue Bucqua and I'm part of the marketing team here at Particle Measuring Systems and I'll be the moderator for today's presentation. If you have questions during our discussion, please submit them. We'll leave about 10 minutes at the end of the webinar to provide answers. If we happen to run out of time before completing the Q&A, the uh, presenters will answer the remaining questions uh, by email. If anyone is having trouble with the audio or video, please use the uh, raise your hand function and I'll try to address it as quickly as possible. I would like to now introduce our first presenter, Mark Haworth. Mark is a life science strategic senior GMP scientist. Uh, Mark has managed the design, installation and validation of over 200 environmental monitoring system projects worldwide. He currently lectures for the PDA, ISP, and other international pharmaceutical societies on environmental monitoring and GMP compliance design and validation. Mark has uh, written over 100 technical papers on environmental monitoring and contributed to several books specific to the field. Uh, Julia Artali will follow Mark's presentation and talk about our mini cap and biocap family of product and how these instruments meet the correct standards of high, um, for high efficiency for physical and biological requirements. Dr. Artali has a degree in biology from the University of Milan with over 20 years experience in microbiology, specifically for pharmaceutical applications. I will now turn over the discussion over to Mark. Thank you. So today's um, presentation is on ISO European Normative 17141 and how it compares to ISO 14698. In August 2020, the normative standard for the European norm, EN 17141, uh, clean rooms and associated controlled environments by contamination control was issued. Now, it wasn't brought into effect until April 2021. So it's a relatively new standard and it essentially replaces within the European standards community ISO 14698 part one and ISO 14698 part two. So it's a single document released that covers the European community that um, essentially replaces 14698. And one of the reasons that they did that was because it didn't go far enough to fully identify instrument selection it didn't go far enough to identify the various applications associated with uh, controlled environments by via contamination control, and uh, and it didn't really go far enough to specify limits as to what the expectations were. Just that you had to consider various techniques, with no real um, guidance as to which technique fitted into into which arena. ISO 14698 parts one and two is still a global standard, just not in Europe. There are two parts in both standards. Primarily, there's the normative components, the normative parts, and there are those parts that are prescriptive. They must be followed to demonstrate compliance with the standard and they describe the establishment of microbiological control. Then there's also the informative component. And those are the parts that are descriptive and that they're meant to aid a reader understanding the concepts presented in the standard and guidance on how to apply the monitoring plans to meet those specific regulated industry um, applications. The standard's quite clear that additional regulatory requirements may be made on those industries by local and international regulatory bodies. So it, it, it's essentially a framework around which GMP can be managed or whatever 
GMP type applications you might have. It's the informative annexes ENF that identify the apparatus that can be used to measure within these applications and guidance is given on selecting the most suitable solutions for applications and verifying or validating their suitability. So we have the normative requirements. Um, I've tried to highlight as best I can without being overly wordy, but I'm afraid that it, it, when reviewing standards, it's always going to be overly wordy. But essentially, they want to um, define what's required in establishing a formal system for microbiological control. To define the microbiological contamination control systems, quality attributes and how to look at those you know, the identification of microbial sources and routes, uh, and specifically those of interest. So where does the contamination come from? And then once we're through that, the risk assessment to see how those sources are generated and their routes into the critical areas, the establishment of a monitoring schedule, the establishment of alert and action levels, verification that control systems are effective, the documentation and education and training is performed. It then starts to look at the data and so trending of data becomes a key parameter and verification that the formal microbiological control system is actually working. A review for out of spec investigations, all of the records that we're taking to demonstrate that compliance, sample tracking that they should have clear identification that covers the entire uh, route from the sample being taken and the materials used to take the sample all the way through to the final result and then the integrity of those results. So in data recording, you've meant to follow the um, you know, expectations for, a record, uh, for recording data and then evaluating that data and various techniques that you could use, you know, statistical techniques you could use at, at looking at data. And that includes grouping and condensing data to, to come up with you know, a more holistic answer. And the evaluation of results should be based on more than one statistical method. I don't rely singularly on one set of criteria um, because data manifests itself in, in different ways, and which is why we end up with trend analysis and single samples are often just not significant outliers, if you will. And so graphical representation of the results collected over a period of time really must be considered. The choice of sampling method, it should be appropriate. Um, and then there's discussion around volumetric eye samplers that are suitable sampling devices selected based upon user requirements. The supplier of the uh, sampler should demonstrate the collection efficiencies, and that's what we're gonna talk about in a little bit. Uh, sampling techniques shall be validated and the volumetric airflow of the sampler will be periodically calibrated. Uh, there's discussion around uh, choice of culture media and incubation uh, to make sure that the right one is being used in the right application and then incubation of the sample prior to results. One point to note is the physical collection efficiency, the requirement of a minimum here in E52 of a D50, that's a 50% efficiency uh, of sizes smaller than two micron is considered appropriate. So it's really looking for ISO 14698 used to talk about collection efficiency down to one micron, but gave no, it could be 1% efficient at one micron or 100% efficient at one micron. It gave no scale, it gave no criteria as to what that value needed to be. Here now we're getting this criteria where it should be 50% efficient at collecting particles smaller than two microns. ISO 14698 versus 17141 uh, again, the test strain requirements are defined for both. A test method is defined for both. And E62 
uh, talks about a simplified lab test method, and that's comparison against an established validated instrument. So if there's no provided information with your sampler for 17141, you can run a relatively rudimentary test. You can see in E64, it's 100% plus or minus 50%. So providing it's within an acceptable range, the, the results performed in an, in an open environment, which is sampling your flora and fauna in that area, um, which is, to be honest, a better reflection as to what you're likely to see on a day-to-day -day basis during sampling anyway, wouldn't, wouldn't be a bad thing running that test anyway, even if supplied with formal testing data. The strains that are used for the both tests as we can see, are the same. There's a little bit of language change, so it should be Bacillus subtilis, and here it should be Bacillus, for example, Bacillus astrophus. So there's a little bit of um, a language difference because the EG lives, uh, leaves a little bit of um, wiggle room, if you will, to pick something that is suitable and, uh, and meets site requirements. In both instances, the test strains used by particle measuring systems on our validation documents meet the specifications for both standards. Other requirements, the two standards uh, harmonize the selection process of a volumetric air sampler. And there's the, uh, that new element in 17141, the D50 for smaller than two microns and the simplified laboratory method. 14698 also offers additional advice on applicability of choosing samples based on its application to monitor the environment and the establishment of a monitoring program. So there's a, a little bit of flexibility in what, um, what technique you choose in 14698. The calculation of that D50, there are three methods that I've used in the past. Uh, the first one is estimating the impingement velocity and comparing that to uh, a, a chart that Mays came up with and uh, and that chart's available and again it's in our technical white paper if, uh, if uh, you're interested in details for that. There's actually calculating the fluid dynamics calculation of what size would um, would impact at what inlet velocity and then ISO EN 17141 also gives an approximation for its own calculation of a D50 uh, and the formulas there on the screen. So if we look at the three different techniques, the D50 using maize, we can see we have you know 25 liters per minute, so a lot slower in impaction velocity. Impaction is a lot easier, the faster the flow rate because of course there's less opportunity for it to vary from those uh, streamlines. So 25 liters per minute, 2.2 microns, 100 liters per minute, 0.8. And if we use the D formula, the D50 formula given in, in the ISO document itself, 25 liters per minute, we're talking about 0.6 microns collection efficiency, and at 100 liters per minute, 0.2 microns. So well within the expected ranges uh, for the ISO standard. Thank you, Mark, for this great presentation. I will now ask Julia to talk about our BioCap and MiniCap mobile instruments. Thanks, Mark, and good day, everyone. In the previous slide, uh, Mark referred to the different uh, air sampling model that we have. The Minicat Mobile is available in three different flow rate, 25, 50, and 100 liter per minute, which uh, allow you to choose the best solution based on, on your specific needs. Certainly, one of uh, the most important parameters to consider for choosing the most appropriate flow rate is the grade of your clean room in which you perform the sampling. The more critical the environmental is, the lower the flow must be in order to reduce the possible interference with the clean room flows 
and uh, on the other hand to ensure a longer sampling which is more representative of the quality of your area. Uh, I want to remember that the new Annex 1, so better, the draft of the new Annex 1 strongly underlines the importance of a continuous sampling. So if it's not possible or is not already adopted the continuous monitoring grade A, the best solution is to select a lower flow rate. The design of uh, our impactor is unique on the market. As you can see from the image, it has uh, 20 slits that form a radial design. This design is clearly visible on the agra after sampling and uh, um, the peculiarity is that it allows the operator to immediately evaluate the quality of the sample. The design of the slits um, ensures the correct direction of their uh, that impacts the surface of the plate. We can say that the microorganisms are, let me say, gently placed on the agar, ensuring their survival. That is the goal of the, the sampling. Last but not least, the distance between the agar and the impactor is always constant. All of those uh, parameters uh, uh, ensures the correct and the best uh, biological efficiency of uh, an active air sampling. This is the last slide. And uh, after I give again the floor to Mark, who will explain some other important details of uh, this uh, ISO. Uh, the Minicad Mobile family offers a complete range of accessories that allows you to cover all your sampling needs. In addition to the remote uh, kits uh, um, that uh, we, we can offer, I would like to underline the compressed gas kit and the possibility of performing sampling with the BioCap single use. Again, uh, let me refer to the draft of the new Annex 1, which underlines the importance of uh, using single-use technology in production area, as well as the importance of gas sampling, especially those uh, that are used during drug production. So for any question about the technology or uh, uh, the, the Minicad mobile solution that we can offer, uh, we can uh, cover at the end of uh, market presentation. So Mark, the word to you. So in summary, there's a lot of, uh, of harmonization between the two requirements uh, for 14698 and EN 17141. The minicapped and biocapped families of products that we offer for all of the flow rates meet those standards for and demonstrate a high efficiency for physical and biological requirements. Microbial products from particle measuring systems comply with both of these international standards and with most instruments, suitable routine maintenance and calibration will keep them with intolerance for many years and additional validation won't be required. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. So there were several questions during the presentation that we will now try to answer. And the first one being, and I think that's a good question for Mark, um, does this ISO standard overrule my GMP? No, is the, is the short answer. EN 17, uh, 17141 puts forward um, a set of rules that outline best practices. But what I didn't go through is uh, Appendix A, B, C, D, talk about the application for GMP or for medical device testing or for food and beverage, those controlled spaces where, um, you, you know, where a higher authority, if you will, uh, rule the limits and, and set the standards for. So, um, they are repeated in that standard. So what the current GMP expectations are within certain areas, they're written into the appendices, but as we know, they're only for information to help you on a path forward and to help try and make sense of the normative elements of the, uh, of the standard. So GMP limits are a, a priority for you. 
the ISO standard gives you a framework and uh, hopefully makes those, uh, those results make sense. Thank you, Mark. Uh, next question, I think is a good question for Julia. Do I have to buy a specific model for the compressed gas? Thank you, Blue, for this question. Uh, very good point. Um, the peculiarity of our solution is that uh, I, we, we can buy the different accessory that we need uh, when we need. So this means that uh, when, when I select the flow rate that is uh, correct or that I want to use in my production during my sampling, in any time I can add the accessory that I need. For the compressed cut kit, the only point that we needed to respect, there is uh, the, um, uh, the only specification that we needed to respect is that there is uh, the compressed gas kit for the 100 liter minute per uh, liter per minute and the same for the other flow rates. So this is the only point, but the um, mini card mobile that uh, I use for the compressed gas kit can be also used for the other kind of sampling. So it's not specific uh, for uh, this kind of uh, uh, application. Okay, Julia, and can I have some more details um, on this single use technology that you propose? The single use technology that uh, we have in our family is the BioCap single use, which is uh, the combination of uh, the impactor and the, the agar itself. Uh, the impactor in this case is not in stainless steel, but is in polypropylene. Uh, it is a, a disposable, so we can use a single use. We have a single use and uh, it's very light. So with the benefit for uh, um, the plug-in and plug-out. And uh, the agar is protected by the polypropylene, so by the impactor, so it's not possible to touch the agar uh, during uh, the sampling. Uh, this is a typical uh, error that time to time occur when operator uh, put the, the plate in the impactor, uh, the standard impactor. And also, of course, uh, there is uh, not the possibility that the agar uh, uh, touch the, the, the surface of the filling line, even if uh, the, the biocap single user fell down, because again, it's protected by the impactor. Um, for any questions uh, um, or if you want more details, uh, you can contact me directly because <laughs> we can speak for a long time about biocap single user, or you can also find some good information on our website. Great. Uh, another question, and I think that we can wrap up with this one for Mark. We are based in the US, but send product to Europe. Do I need to use both ISO standards? Um, if, again, this kind of goes back to, uh, to my first question for GMP. GMP, if you're shipping product from the US to Europe, you know, do you need to meet both of those standards? Fortunately, if your most instrumentation, certainly our instrumentation, meets both standards, so it doesn't really matter what um, you know which standard you, you sort of like hang your hat on. But again, GMP is your overarching guidance as to what needs to be done. So if you're shipping product to Europe, then you got to be in compliance with EU GMP. If it's sterile, Annex One. If it's non-sterile and one of the other annexes. So it, if you're in Europe shipping product to the US, same, the, the, the 14698 was the global standard, so whatever you're using will meet that specification. And now you're going to have to also meet um, the expectations of the FDA for the results and how you present data. Thanks very much for that question. Okay, so that is all for today. I would like to thank everyone for attending. If we were unable to address your question during the webinar, uh, we will be following up with the individuals directly. If you have additional questions, please feel free to email either Mark or Julia directly or use our info inbox at pmeasuring.com. Thank you and have a great day.